We have to turn the ESG story into what's been the last 10 years of we're kind of on the fringe. It's nice. It's good. You know, how do you value good? No, it's not that. It's good business. Like if you're not thinking through these problems, you're not looking out for your shareholders to best utilize your capital and get a lower cost and give the consumer a product they can afford. Welcome to Climate Positive, a podcast produced by Hannon Armstrong, a leading investor in climate solutions. I'm Chad Reed. I'm Hillary Langer. I'm Gil Jenkins. In this series, we host candid conversations with the leaders, innovators, and changemakers driving our climate positive future. In this episode, we speak with Jonathan Webb, founder and CEO of App Harvest. App Harvest, which became a public company earlier this year, is building some of the largest indoor farms in the world, combining conventional agricultural techniques with the latest technology to grow non-GMO, chemical-free produce sold to top U.S. grocers. The company's first controlled environment agriculture facility, which opened in 2020 in Moorhead, Kentucky, spans 60 acres. It uses 90% less water than a typical farm because of a sophisticated circular irrigation system and 10-acre rainwater retention pond. In today's conversation, Jonathan discusses the unique aspects of App Harvest's business, his personal journey in starting the company, the parallels of ag tech with the solar revolution, the specific advantages of controlled environment agriculture, what it's like to experience rapid growth while maintaining a culture of excellence, how ESG drives the business, and a whole lot more. We hope you enjoy this spirited conversation with a passionate climate solutions entrepreneur as much as we did. He is leading a truly purpose-driven company focused on reinventing farming for a changing planet. So with that, here is Gil Jenkins and me, Chad Reed, in conversation with Jonathan Webb. Jonathan, welcome to Climate Positive. We're honored to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. For our listeners who may not be following the ag tech space that closely, could you give us a sense of the app harvest business, what you're trying to accomplish, and could you also give us a sense of your background, your own personal journey in, in starting the company? Yeah, well, one, again, th- thank you for having me. And, and these discussions are important. I'm going to kind of start and then get to that with, uh, you know, this morning I was just reading the reports that came out where there was a study of, of 10,000 young people that had been interviewed in 10 different countries. And 56% of those young people said they're deeply concerned about the future based on the, the climate disruption that continues to unfold in front of their eyes. And so we at App Harvest, we're focused on food and agriculture. You look at basic pillars of human life and it's water, it's energy, and it's food. And if you don't have those, you don't have a society. They're not nice to have. They're absolute essential basic necessities that we must all ensure and protect. So what does App Harvest do? So we're a controlled environment agriculture company. We use technology to grow a fruit and vegetable with 90% less water, get 30 times more yield per acre, get the harsh chemical pesticides out of the growing practice. And we do it with people. And and we've tried to say, put people and planet first. Our employees, we're very proud of. Everybody makes a living wage. Everybody has full health care, and everybody has equity in the company. So it's not just what we're doing, it's how we're doing it with our people. uh, And then ultimately where we're doing it. I'm sitting in Kentucky right now, uh, it was one of the largest coal producing states in the U.S. Most all the coal mines have shut down in central Appalachia, and we're building this organization in the heart of central Appalachia, where we have, is actually raining outside right now. We've had record amounts of rainfall over the last decade. So you see California drying up, the, the southwest of the U.S. running out of water. So we're building facilities to grow fruit and vegetable, get it to the east coast, midwest, southeast in a day drive, and do it here where we have you know, a great workforce and and tons of rainwater we can use to to supply our facilities. What are the specific advantages of CEA over traditional soil-based farming? Could you walk us through kind of those top-line benefits? To be abundantly clear, the the best way to grow a plant is in good soil with good water and and use the sun and use nature. I mean, we, we try to say here at App Harvest that the best technology on planet Earth is the planet Earth. And and the most complex technology is that biomatter on planet Earth. The problem is 
we've destroyed our planet to a point to where it's almost becoming impossible you know, to predict yields and farm outside and feed eight, nine billion people 10, 20, 30 years from now. Agriculture is incredibly complex. There's great ways to do it outdoors. So I'm a big fan of Wendell Berry here in Kentucky. I'm a big fan of the four season organic farmers that, you know, rotate their crops and regenerative ag. And the problem that farmers are facing is, you know, we talk about extractive industries and, and I'm sitting where the fossil fuel industry and the coal industry got completely dismantled. And my career was in wind and solar. So I, I really saw it on both sides, but we're so simplistic in our viewpoints of ex extractive industries. We're also extracting nutrients out of the ground at a rate that are not being replenished. We're also extracting water out of freshwater reservoirs and rivers that are not being replenished. Those need to be categories that are also extractive. And we figure out again, how are we building systems to maintain the current level of supply while extracting? So again, it's not us versus soil, it's us versus people who farm with harsh chemical pesticides that degrade the soil and kill all the nutrients. It's us versus you know, people that use child labor and open field farming. And in 2021, anywhere on planet Earth, I would like to think everybody deserves to make a living wage if you work on a farm. There are organic farmers, there are four season farmers, there are regenerative farmers that are working tirelessly to do it right. The problem is they're few and far between and the larger farming that we know of, it's a scorched earth approach with short term goals and short term incentives. And no one's asking the what if question. What if the Colorado River runs out? What if we deplete all the freshwater reservoirs in California? What if we extract the nutrients out of the soil and we don't regenerate them to where the soil is no longer fertile? Great. We're going to focus on fossil fuels. We're going to focus on solving energy around the world. In the meantime, we're not going to have water and we won't have food. So we have to use controlled environment agriculture. The technologies have evolved. I try to compare it to solar and wind 20 years ago. Almost no one knew about it in the U.S. It was a nascent industry. It has exploded over the last 20 years. And that's largely because government aligned with the private sector, the technologies evolved, and we executed at scale. Then you see electric vehicles. Tesla goes public in 2010. And in the last 10 years, everybody and their mother's brother is talking about buying an electric vehicle. Every major automotive company in the world is shifting their entire fleets to electric vehicles. Now, in this present moment, we're in that third wave of sustainable infrastructure and it's controlled environment agriculture. The technologies have all evolved to a point to where we can compete with dirty open field farming that just has no place on planet Earth in 2021. And we can support the organic regenerative farmer that is treating our water and soils properly. So it should be an all above solution. Uh, it shouldn't be an us versus them, but it should be an us versus the stuff that's killing our water, killing our nutrients, killing our people. And that's where controlled environment agriculture can be incredibly complementary. We grow year round. You control the environment on the inside. So it can either be a warehouse or a glass facility. So for that plant, uh, tomato plant or leafy green or strawberry, you're not manipulating the plant itself. It, it's a, it's a non-GMO seed. We're manipulating the climate around it so that we're giving that plant exactly what it needs. The amount of nutrient it needs, the amount of water it needs, the temperature, the light with our LED lights. So we're, we're altering the environment, uh, using AI to scan the plant to see if there's pests or disease, using robotics to help operate the facility. But those convergence of technologies have all come together into really one term, and that's controlled environment agriculture. It's a lot of different ways to do it, but just want to make it very clear, and that was a long way of saying it's definitely not us versus soil. It's us versus open field farming that is destroying nutrients and destroying water, and we have to figure out how to complement the farmers that are doing it right. I'm so glad you said that. I, I'm struck by so many things you said, and I just want to quickly follow up on, you know, you mentioned the parallels with solar and wind and how that has completely exploded in the last 10 years in terms of growth. And the reasons for that are, are well documented. Isn't there another parallel 
particularly when we think about distributed solar as it relates to what, what you're doing, it's about bringing it closer to the load centers. In that sense, you're bringing clean and healthy produce closer to where it's purchased. Could you talk a little bit about parallels between the solar revolution and what you're doing in AgTech? Yeah. So, you know, just to be clear, my last job, you know, I built large scale solar and was a part of a team that was supporting the Department of Defense that had an initiative to achieve 20% renewables by 2025. You know, I was one person on a very large team, but uh, what I was afforded was an opportunity to see all these wonderful technologies and battery storage and, and solar and wind and geothermal. And yeah, there, there are a lot of similarities between that industry and CEA. There's the resiliency aspect, and then there's the bringing it closer to markets. We try to look at the history of, of the American food system and you know, look at the 1880s when the railroads were developed and how did we get to this point? Like, why are we shipping leafy greens two and 3,000 miles? I mean, what the... It is what it is. It's a long, circuitous path that got us here. But it, you talk about unsustainable. It's it's just ridiculous. We a, a tomato in Mexico going to the East Coast can sit two or three weeks on a truck. Of course, kids don't want to eat fruits and vegetables. They taste horrible. I mean, they're just, the seeds are genetically modified for transportation, not flavor, not nutrient density. The genetically modified seed is so that the fruit or vegetable can sit on the truck and not rot. So it's a hard green rubber ball that ends up turning orange over time once it gets to a consumer's plate. Uh, tastes horrible, doesn't have the nutrient quality that it should. And from a sustainability aspect, look at the amount of, you know, the diesel we're using to transport two to 3,000 miles. So, you know, food waste in the U.S., we have a 40%, USDA has said 40% of fruits and vegetables in the U.S. go in a landfill. Well, how are we going to get that number down? Pretty simple. Get the fruit and vegetable to the consumer within a day or two of it being picked. So for us, our geographic location, we picked Kentucky for a lot of reasons. One, I'm from here and I love it, but this is not a passion project. I just so happened to you know, be from an area that was very well suited for this industry. I said that we have record amounts of rainfall. It's been a wettest year on decades. So we're collecting rain we're taking that rain to grow a fruit and vegetable. So 95% of a fruit and vegetable is water, 95%. So if you don't have water, how do you have a company that grows something that requires water? But the, the geographic location of where we're at allows us to get to 70% of the U.S. in a one-day drive. It's the same reason the coal industry thrived in eastern Kentucky and West Virginia. It was not just because they had the coal, it's because those companies could mine the coal, then get it to electric utilities all the way from Florida to Detroit to New York to St. Louis within a one-day drive to power plants and reliably power 70% of the U.S. Well, food is just another form of energy, and it powers the human body. So we're putting these facilities in central Appalachia, collecting the rainwater, and allowing us to get to a consumer in a one-day drive. It gets our food waste tremendously down. It reduces our trucking by almost two weeks. And it's, it's good for the planet and it's ultimately good for the consumer. I want to talk a little bit about the facilities themselves. They're, they're quite large, right? We're talking how many football fields large are these facilities? And you talked a lot about water usage and, and consumption. How do you collect rainwater and, and use that efficiently through these large facilities? It's all about scale for us. My background, the one thing I, I learned is people go, oh, well, solar's expensive. We can't reliably, you know, you can't power the U.S. on solar. It's expensive. Well, it can be expensive depending on who's building it and how you build it. But it's simple economics, right? Uh, economies of scale. The bigger thing you do, the cheaper it is. The more you can buy, the cheaper it is. doesn't matter, you know, what you're buying. So the more steel and glass and, you know, lights and everything that goes into our facility, if we build really big, well, then our, our unit economic price comes down. Same thing with solar. If you build you know, a 500 megawatt solar facility or a half a megawatt solar facility, your half a megawatt solar facility, that cost per kilowatt hour for the electron is going to be exponentially higher because there's so many costs bundled in to just getting a half a megawatt online versus you build really big somewhere uh, you get your unit economic price down, which as a result gets your you know, per kilowatt hour down. 
think of our electron as a fruit and vegetable. We're, it's the exact same thing. We're just building really big stuff. Now the difference is it's not a plug and play like solar. Solar and, and wind are pretty easy. Once you build it, you plug it in, you sit and stare at it, and every now and again, somebody maintenances it. That is not this. These are plants, they're living, they require tremendous attention, but the sheer scale of it. So our Moorhead facility, 2.8 million square feet under glass. Uh, we elected to build a glass facility instead of a warehouse. And again, I'm, I'm not a physicist or I wasn't a PhD or scientist in agriculture, but prior to App Harvest, I think what helped me was just looking at how you build a system to get the most efficient result. And there's a couple things you need, really three, in order to grow a plant on planet Earth. And sunlight and rainwater are two of them. So if you want to get your costs down, obviously you want to build a really big thing so you can get your unit economics on steel down. But then how you grow it is equally important. And ultimately, I come to this with a very simple mind. We cannot raise prices on consumers who are already struggling week by week to make a paycheck. It is our obligation as companies to come up with solutions that work, align with the planet, but then give the American people an opportunity to buy the product. You know, most people don't have the opportunity to go spend their whole paycheck at a grocery store. They don't. Our obligation as a sustainable community is to focus on the 95% hardworking Americans that want to be a part of these solutions, but they don't have the opportunity to pay for it. So it is critical. It is our job to make this affordable. That is the only way we're going to get there. And if we're coming at it from that viewpoint, then shouldn't we grow a fruit and vegetable with sunlight and rainwater? In order to get our costs down and have use less electricity, Shouldn't we use the sun first, then use LED lights? And that's what a glass structure allows us to do. If we were in a warehouse, we can't use the sunlight. So we're reliant solely on LED light. Can you do it? Yeah, you can do it. Is it a good application for Alaska? Yeah, probably. Uh, is it a good application in most of the world? Not economically, it isn't. Uh, rainwater, you know, another critical function. You look at some of the worst infrastructure in the U.S. right now, some of the most aging you know, critical infrastructure that can fundamentally destroy this country. It is our water systems. So for App Harvest to control our own destiny, collect all of our rainwater, we're not even connected to city water for our growing. We're not even connected to city sewer to put waste disposal down. We collect all that rainwater on our roof, which is 2.8 million square feet. Think of your roof, think of your house. It's like that triangle and think of that you know, multiplied by a thousand. So we have all these triangular roofs that, with gutters that go along. We collect the rainwater in all those gutters. Those gutters go into pipes. The pipes go into a big pond. The pond is almost 70 Olympic sized swimming pools. We only filter that water with sand and UV, no chemicals, sand to get the particulate matter out, uh, UV to kill any bacteria. We pump that into the facility. We add nutrients, it goes to the plants. Once our water is in our facility, the only way it leaves is as a fruit and vegetable. So we keep recycling that water inside until the plants absorb it, and then it leaves as a fruit and vegetable. That's where, and I think your show is important in the conversations you continue to have, ESG has to be affordable, and sustainability has to be a part of your business model to save money. So, of course, if you get less waste, that's more money. If you can use sunlight and rainwater, that's lower costs. In all of my investor meetings, I would have investors go, oh, well, ESG, that's nice, it's cute, you know, but you have to have a business. And my thing is, okay, great. Will you tell me how that business is gonna continue to work in the Southwest of the US where you don't have water? Let me know how that's gonna work. So we have to turn the ESG story into what's been the last 10 years of, we're kind of on the fringe, it's nice, you know, oh, they're going to, it's good. You know, how do you value good? No, it's not that. It's good business. Like it's the right, like if you're not thinking through these problems, you're not looking out for your shareholders to best utilize your capital and get a lower cost and give the consumer a product they can afford. So, you know, all of this has to play together. You know, we at App Harvest are not perfect. We make mistakes every day, every week. We have a long way to go uh, to, to achieve our goals and, and really be the company we want to be. 
Uh, but we're very hard on ourselves every single day. I, it is raise the bar, get better. And, and we have to do it for our shareholders. We have to do it for our consumers. That's the only way ESG is going to work. And ESG is past the point of it makes me feel good. So I'm going to invest in that company. No, no, no. The business has to work. That's how ESG is going to attract trillions of dollars and rebuild our world. And we don't need to demonize Wall Street. It is what it is. Wall Street's a tool. You know, go make your voice heard, change business models. The private sector can be a part of solving all these people and planet issues. We don't have time anymore. We know Wall Street can deploy billions of dollars of capital as efficiently is human civilization has ever seen. So how do we build business models that align with people and planet so we can go grab capital, put companies in place and give consumers a product at an affordable price? And so that's our lens every day. And that's ultimately why we built really big and, and ultimately why we use sunlight and why we use rainwater uh, in, in a lens that we try to think through every single day here at App Harvest. Yeah, you know, in Hannah and Armstrong, our company was built on the backbone of energy efficiency. It was the cheapest electron out there is the one you don't consume. And similarly with water, the cheapest gallon of water is the one you don't consume. I mean, ESG is, is obviously a big focus of, of our company. And since we're on that topic, you know, you are a public benefit corporation and a B Corp, I believe. You're one of the very few publicly traded companies that are both. And you mentioned ESG and how you integrate it into your business model and operation. Can you talk a little bit more about how ESG actually drives those cost savings? Do you use LED lighting? How does your shipping practices, which probably are, are low carbon, you know, drive down costs? And you, you mentioned a little about the water savings technologies already, but tell us specifically how your focus on sustainability and ESG actually drives your costs lower. All of it. So, you know, you got to get food waste down. You got to get trucking miles down. You have to use rainwater that's free and abundant. Thank you, you know, planet Earth. If you're in the right region, you have to use sunlight, all of it. It's not a nice to have anymore. You know, we don't have luxury to pillage our resources the way we have. And if you want to look out for your business and ensure you're not bankrupt in 10, 20, 30 years, then you need to build resiliency into your business model. You need to build resiliency so you have a model that can sustain and, and give the consumer affordable pricing. So, yes, we're, I think, one of five, maybe less than 10 companies now that is a publicly traded company on a major exchange or on the NASDAQ, went public earlier this year, that is both a public benefit corporation, so the way we're filed, and we also have the B Corp certificate. Every company should be moving in that direction out of sheer self-preservation. I mean, and that's where you all and me and others listeners on your show probably care about ESG for a lot of the right reasons. But you know what? I've realized some people are never going to get there. Some people just want to make money. And it is what it is. We can try to change greed and power in the world, but it's kind of never happened over history. Or we can just motivate greedy people to understand that their own self-preservation, they would might lose their job and their company could go bankrupt if they don't have resilient business models. And that's where our generation, who's now kind of coming of age, so to speak, I'm a pretty young CEO. I hope to have another 30 years. I turned 36 going on 37 and just got married. And you know, I'm thinking of my next 30 years and I'm on a war path for App Harvest. But here's what's interesting. My friends are running for Congress my friends are, are taking jobs on Wall Street. It's no more protesting. It's go do it. And if the people on the other end aren't doing it, let's get them fired and out of the boardroom. That's it. Change the board. Push them out the back door. And, and that is where we have to be firm. We have to be ethical. And we have to play in the legal bounds. But we need to charge because that's what the other side's doing. And one way to motivate these CEOs their greedy mind of just wanting to make money, well, show them a clear path that they either make more money through implementing ESG or their company is on a fast track going straight underground. So out of their own selfish desires, what are they going to do? That's just the way we're going to have to operate. And not everybody is going to care with a heart and a mind and think, you know what? I want to make sure the next generation has a better life than I had. Unfortunately, some people in the world just aren't going to think that way. So let's give them a here and now reason and force them to think that way or find ways in which we can get them out of the boardroom, out of the executive rooms 
and off these companies where they shouldn't be guiding companies to the next 10 and 20 years. And again, part of that is short-term incentive. I mean, we wonder again, why aren't we going in the right direction? Well, politicians get reelected every two and four years. CEOs are judged by quarterly earnings and annual guidance. And we wonder why no one's looking out for the next 10 and 20 years. It isn't that confusing. Pretty simple. So it's our job now, as we in our mid 30s and mid 40s are taking over large roles in companies, we need to be the politicians. We need to be the executives in the boardroom. We need to push, rewrite the rules of the game, because if we don't, it's not going to happen. And there's no, and that's where, again, my friends in the ESG world, we need to get out of the streets and stop protesting. Look, that worked to a point. It worked. It's time to roll up your sleeves. Do the hard work, work 18 hours a day if that's what it takes, go work at companies, build companies. And again, we're not perfect at App Harvest. We have a long, long way to go, but our team is incredibly proud to be one of those you know, less than 10 companies in the world that, that can say we're a public benefit corporation and a B Corp. And frankly, these conversations, and when I say this type of stuff, we just have a bigger and bigger and bigger target on our back here at App Harvest. And that's the risk that we play, that you know, the more we talk about this, the more that target on us grows. And we're not gonna save agriculture. There's gonna be hundreds of great companies working in agriculture and food. You know, we're not the end all be all in the region we're working in, but we're one company and we can't have a loud voice. And, and I don't see anybody as competition. If you're doing it right, I give CEOs my phone number that quote unquote should be competitors. Call me, let's work together. Like how can we help each other grow? That's a perfect segue. Let's talk about people, right? You've grown from 20 employees at the start of 2020 to, as of April, 500. I bet it's more now. What has it been like experience such rapid growth? And talk about the culture. How do you maintain that with su at such a growth clip? You have to have these frank, honest conversations. I cannot be the McKinsey CEO that sits in a box and analyzes everything. I mean, part of the culture is real authenticity, transparency, and trying to give people as much autonomy to run as possible. Yeah, it was psychotic to go from 20 people to 500 people in the middle of COVID, might I add. So we built one of the largest facilities in the world. We hired to stand it up and train people in the middle of COVID. And no secret here, we, we had a quarterly earnings call that was recently held. You know, we lowered some of our guidance and, and missed some of our targets in Q2. So we had trouble training people in the middle of COVID. But how about this? We had people in the middle of COVID. I had 500 people showing up to work every single day, busting everything they had to figure out how they get better. I'm proud of my team. You talk about this notion of faith and grit. And that's not your typical corporate speak values and how you manifest that to team and growing the fruits and veggies in a better way. How do you arrive at that? Because that's, that's not pull off a, a McKinsey tested thing. I, I just love that. You talk about faith and grit as a concept. I'm one of those people that graduated from public schools here and was told time and again what I wouldn't be. We need to unlock potential inside of everyone. I love my friends that got Ivy League degrees, and they're privileged enough to have that. And we have people on our team, and they're wicked smart. But you know who else is wicked smart? My entry-level employee. And we have to unlock the potential inside of everyone. we got to do it in this company. And one way is, again, you have that faith inside of yourself. You have that grit and determination. You wake up every single day challenging yourself to get better and just block out the outside noise of, of what you can't do, and you believe in yourself and what you can do. Yeah. I personally grew up in Western Pennsylvania and sometimes I refer to that as the intersection of Appalachia and the Rust Belt, you know, an area very hard hit by job losses. You know, the steel industry is not nearly as strong as it wants to be. There's there's no coal anymore. And and the companies that were there haven't even taken care of the retirees. They've slashed the pension benefits and health care. But you have created, as you noted, at least 500 jobs right in the middle of Appalachia. You noted that you're, you're training workers. Could you talk a little bit about the programs you have with uh, local high schools and uh, agricultural universities to drive the workforce growth that you need to grow your business going forward? We're investing in the super long term. We're putting high school curriculum in place, changing college curriculum in the state of Kentucky so that we can have a pipeline of brilliant people that are maybe they'll start their own company or maybe they'll come work with us. We have to get in deep early with young people's minds. 
I'm the CEO of a public charity company, scratching my head going, why isn't every company doing this? I don't get it. We're, we're being treated here in Kentucky like some revolutionary radical because we're investing in high school education. People didn't even know how to initially were, how we put the money in. They were like, wait, I don't know. How do you, you want to in two weeks put technology at our school and let our kids use it to grow leafy greens and take it to class? How do we let that happen? Thankfully, we had a governor here. We have mayors, Republicans and Democrats and independents that go, you know what? The laws in place probably might slow this down. We're going to figure out how to do this. No is not an answer. We're going to get to a yes. And we've had high school principals. We've had high school teachers. We've had students who've just taken this thing over. Uh, our goal now is to be at 20 high schools in Kentucky. I hope it's a model for America. We want all high schools in Kentucky to eventually have the, these technologies. And ultimately, uh, think of a shipping container. I met Kimball Musk. Uh, went to go tour Square Roots in Brooklyn, uh, and that's where the idea came from was, wait a second, let's take this shipping container concept, put it at every high school, let young people operate a farm with an iPhone and iPad using software and sensors, growing leafy greens year round, let them take the leafy green into the classroom and give it, you know, these are kids that, why do we have food insecurity in America when we can just be letting kids learn how to grow with technology then they get to take it home. So you have kids that you are food insecure that can take it home to their family. They can take it in the lunchroom. Uh, thankfully, Republicans and Democrats have all figured out how to play nice here in Kentucky. And this model is rolling out. I hope that someone in D.C. calls us soon. We've been talking to different secretaries. I see there being no reason. There's no IP around this with App Harvest. Why every high school in America doesn't grow their own fruits and vegetables using technology, giving kids skills, and letting those fruits and vegetables go to a classroom. Awesome. This is the tradition in our podcast where we turn to our lightning round. Uh, we call it the hot seat. So the first set is fill in the blank. The most important advice or feedback I have followed is... Have a passion, follow it, and believe in yourself. The most important advice or feedback I have rejected is? You're not good enough. Anybody in this world can do anything when they put their mind to it. The word or phrase I most overuse is? This is hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If it's not hard, why are you doing it? You know, I, I keep like trying to figure out, I tell myself, why am I always in these hard situations? Because you only live once. You want to prop your feet up and just coast? No. So I, I probably say this is hard but a little too much, but it's, it's a little dose of reminder that, you know, maybe we're doing the right things if it's hard. Success is? Giving people coming in behind us a better chance than what we had. I mean, I, every night I think about every parent from my parents. I was very lucky. I had great parents. They wanted to give me a better life. So they sacrificed in the short term to give their kids a better life. You know, the thing that keeps me up the most at night, it, it means no matter how hard I work, no matter what I do, my kids might walk into a world that's worse than what I had. So what is success? Sacrifice. Learning from your mistakes. But I would say if I had to put it into one word, success is sacrifice. And then you have to think, what are you sacrificing for? And it better not be for greed and it better not be for money. I hope it's for the right things. Is it for your family? Is it for your community? You mentioned Martha Stewart's on your board. Uh, has she told you the best way to prepare your tomatoes? I'm sure she's got the recipe. Can you share it? My God, you talk about somebody that's just like up at 5 a.m. in the garden, texting you at midnight. She's a critic, you know, but she's a critic because her attention to detail is like something I've never seen before her. When we shipped her the first tomatoes, I was up all night thinking, oh, my God, is Martha going to like them? Martha loved them. So uh, she is a hard critic. She gives direct feedback, but that feedback's been very valuable to us here. So the recipe, though, what's the best? Did she tell you? You got to. Oh, yeah, we recently did it. So, well, I'm here in Kentucky and she comes with this no knife pasta. And so we're tearing up tomatoes literally without a knife and like putting it in the 
in the pot to make, you know, homemade marinara. And she's like, so when you don't have a knife and you might be out on your yacht, I'm like, <laughs> or Martha, when you don't have a knife and you might be at your RV or trailer by a creek side, you can do the same <laughs> thing. So uh, she did give us a recipe. We're probably going to be releasing that recipe pretty soon. Uh, so the, be the best recipe we've had from her so far is a, a no knife pasta where you use your hands to tear up the tomatoes and, and make the marinara. Got it. I'm a UMass guy too, public university. So I am jealous of the hoop dominance at your alma mater. You know, I would remind you that in our listeners that Coach Cal did start at UMass before he went on to great things at, at your school. So who's the best UK basketball player of all time? Oh, you, you can't have me do that. No way. I'm, I'm sitting too close to Rupp Arena to, to answer that question. Uh, but we do take a lot of learning lessons from Coach Cal on, you know, he does say something that I think resonates here, which is this place isn't for everyone. Like, it's not. Being an elite player, like, you don't walk out of bed and be elite. Like, to be the top of your game, a top athlete, you have to want it. And that pressure and urgency is not for everyone. So we have taken that. Who is the best basketball player to come out of Kentucky? Oh, my gosh. Too many to name. I mean, there's 35 players in the NBA right now, but there's probably as good or better players that, you know, 10 and 20 years ago. So I, I can't do that. If I say that, it, it might not mean anything on this show to national listeners, but here in Kentucky, I will – uh, I'll have people throwing tomatoes at me if I don't say the right name. Sure. Well, there are just so many good ones. That's, <laughs> so many, yeah. Too many good Great. ones. Great. Good. Happy for you. Last two questions. My climate role model is? I think some of the indigenous people that have managed to live on this earth for thousands and thousands of years, and then here we come in and disrupt everything. We have to go back to figure out and learn some of that knowledge that we've lost, whether it's you know Native Americans that lived here or you know, indigenous people in South America. My climate heroes are the indigenous people that, that carried on civilization in the middle of ice storms and deserts, and, and they used nothing but nature to survive. And, and we've lost a lot of that information. I love science. I love modern technology. I'm, I'm a fact-based, data-driven person. But we need to go back and look at a lot of the legacy information we've lost and what some of these people knew. You know, people say microbes are the next unknown. We have no idea what microbes are. It's this interconnected web underneath the soil, plants that are communicating with each other. Nature is communicating with each other. Trees know what other trees, when they're in distress, it is phenomenal. And, and our indigenous people that lived thousands of years ago unlocked a lot of that knowledge inside of these plants. We've lost that. We've gone industrial science, and there's a, there's a balance, and and we need to go back to looking at what planet Earth has to offer, looking at the plants, and see what they have to offer, and unlocking that knowledge. We're scratching at the surface. We're not even close. I mean, we are so clueless the way this planet works. And if we're going to solve our climate crisis, the planet is going to solve it for us. We are going to be the medium that allows to make it happen, but we need to figure out how we're going to harness the, the knowledge inside of planet Earth, and hopefully we can put those people... You know what I'd love to see? Indigenous people get on boards of publicly traded companies. Let them in a boardroom. Let them talk from their perspective. You know, again, we have to radically change the way we think about we, how we solve these problems. We can't assume humans alone and our ego is going to solve our climate problems. It's not going to happen. And we have to look to nature and who has looked to nature the best, uh, you know, th those indigenous people that have lived all around the world for thousands of years. Okay, last one. To me, climate positive means sustainability and resiliency. I mean, I need to know that my grandkids and their grandkids are going to have a better life than me. Keep fighting, Jonathan. This is awesome work. And, and thank you for sharing your story and App Harvest story. Thank you. Hey, we're going to figure it out. You all are a part of the conversation that's accelerating these stories. Appreciate the opportunity and, and keep doing the work you're doing to, to highlight these stories over the next couple of years. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Take care. All right, guys. Thanks. Bye. Climate Positive is produced by Hannah Armstrong. Tell us what you thought about the conversation. You can send us show ideas by tweeting at us at Hannah Armstrong or send us a note at climatepositive at hannahnarmstrong.com. If you like the show, feel free to give us a rating or share with a friend. 
It helps others learn about the show and our climate positive mission. I'm Chad Reed, and this is Climate Positive.